It's been a fire hose of information, uh, and uh, you know it can be a lot to digest. And it's really easy for the brain to start, you know, to going into manual shut off. Uh, usually by day three of something, just because there's so much to process. But uh, I think this is going to be a really interesting way to end these couple of days uh, and think about what some of the big takeaways are here. Um, before I dive into, into this panel session, though, I'd like to invite up uh, one more time um, Mayor Brad Woodside of, uh, of Fredericton just for some closing thoughts about what he's taking away from the last couple of days. And uh, off to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very pleased to extend to you some closing thoughts, what I've learned. And what I've learned, I'm not surprised. Uh, because really what this is all about and everything that everybody talks about is connectivity. It's, it's about broadband and the availability of it. I, uh, I'm reminded of Gangnam City being in the, the most intelligent city of the world back a while ago and I actually went over and uh, visited Gangnam City and I'll tell you they're doing some incredible things. Uh, the least of which is dancing, which has just recently <laughs> come up. And uh, 2.5 million views and uh, counting, which is really introducing to the world the culture of South Korea. But it shows you the power of communication. But it also tells me there's a lot of people out there that don't have that advantage. And it shouldn't be an advantage, it should be a right. So, what I'm going to take upon myself as the uh, second vice president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, because I happen to be in the right place at the right time, is to pursue with our federal government a national strategy. A national strategy where connectivity is not something that is just good for those that live in the urban areas, but also those in the rural areas. That's what I'm all about. And, uh, you know, when people ask me, how did you do it? Well, first of all, it's, it's not impossible. It, you have to, of course, have your community together, have everybody on the same page, but I think everybody has to work together from a national perspective. Down to the provincial level, down to the local level, all understanding where we are and where we want to be and how we're not going to get there if we're placing ourselves beneath Romania on the list of, of uh, countries around the world that are doing broadband and doing a great job. The video you saw on Australia is, is a prime example of, of doing it and doing it right. And does it have to cost a lot of money? No, it doesn't. I think there's ways to, to do it, ways to get around it. Of course, it, it can be commercialized to some extent, to some degree, but I liken it back, like I said yesterday, to the telephone. It's, uh, we're in the same place today as we were back in the days of the telephone. Not a whole lot has changed. I'm uh, just catching a flight, Jasmine, and I'm going to the Intelligent Communities Forum in uh, Vancouver, and we'll be speaking there and carrying basically the same message. What I want is every Canadian across the country to, be, to have the ability to communicate on broadband and, and wireless internet, and I think the wireless, just like it's in Fredericton, it should be free and it should be no charge, because, you know, we will all be the beneficiaries of that. And if we can't communicate amongst ourselves, we'll never get to communicate around the world. And if for some reason I come up with one of these weird dances, I've got to have the vehicle to be able to transmit them. So I want to say thanks. It's been a pleasure meeting everybody. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Enjoy your flight. He's got his getaway car outside. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Peter, I'll hand this to you for later. Great, thank you. Uh, what a fantastic call to action, and uh, here, here. And I certainly know a couple really great Romanian entrepreneurs who came to Canada to build their startup and credit their time in Canada to their successful exit to Twitter. So uh, on that, and as well as far as the connectivity point goes, uh, really amazing even just to know where we have gone in the past 10 years. 10 years ago, I was up with the uh, wireless internet basically launch um, in the Northwest Territories, and that was only 10 years.
years ago. So we've come a remarkable way, but as uh, Mayor Woodside is saying, there's so much more to do, and the people in this room are those that can make it happen. So thank you for all being here. Um, and speaking about that, that just means that really one of the biggest takeaways from the past couple of days is about leadership. We've talked a lot about big data, what that means, how to mine it, how to you know make meaning out of it, and how to tell stories. Uh, but the fact is, is there's still a lot of people who aren't privy to these types of conversations, who are trying to think about how to move their organizations forward, their technology forward, and think about the future. Uh, but they need people like those of us here in the room to, uh, to tell them how important it is and how to do it. So the leadership aspect is really key. And uh, that's what we'll touch on here as this, as this closing panel goes on. And uh, I actually think we've got a really interesting group of people here to do that. We essentially have an astronomer, a technophile, someone who shared a lot of his personal gadgetry with us last night, and, and a storyteller. So what a diverse group of people to talk about leadership in this space and, uh, and our role and responsibilities and, and moving that forward and some final thoughts. So uh, to get started, how we're going to work this is we're actually going to go down the line. Um, we're not going to start as a typical panel and, we, and doing a lot of back and forth. We're going to let each of these fine gentlemen uh, present their ideas and takeaways for about 12 minutes. Um, they'll each do that, and then we'll open up for just basically a lively dialogue between all of us before calling it a wrap, and, uh, and getting outside and enjoying that first dust of snow <laughs> that came that was so truly Canadian. Uh, and so to get started, Russell, we'll invite you up first. And, um, Russell has an amazing uh, bio and background, and it really makes me wish that when I was in junior high or high school that I really could have thought about what I was going to do when I grew up, because now I'm having quite the... Um, existential dilemma about what I can be. And so, um, Russell, I won't introduce you fully because I actually would love to hear some of your takeaways over your career. So if you don't mind, if you can take your first minute, just describe your background, your career, and some, and some highlights and set the tone for the presentation. That'd be wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my, my story uh, in this panel session is about uh, how curiosity, basic curiosity-driven science can, can drive a big data challenge for, for the globe. Um, so the SK project is what I'm going to talk about, and I have been involved in that project for quite some time. And uh, given the theme of this, uh, this session, I will unashamedly point out where leadership from Canada uh, comes from in this project. Um, so uh, the actual project actually developed in Canada. In 1994, I organized a meeting uh, in Canada, brought together the global community of astronomers to ask the question, what is it we need to do um, to answer the next big questions in astronomy as a world community. And the Square Pond Array project arose out of that conversation. And in 1998, four years later, we had a meeting here in Calgary where this project emerged as a global collaboration to actually build uh, this big device. So I've been involved in radio astronomy for a long time. I've been at the University of Calgary now for 25 years. Um, and uh, have, over the course of those 25 years, evolved um, to work in projects that are driven by data because it has become apparent that to address um, the big questions we have as a, as, a, as, a, as a human race, where do we come from, are we alone in the universe, how did the universe actually come to be the way it is now, those are turning out to be big data questions. Um, so my drive over the last several years has been to solve, or to, to work towards answering those questions using uh, data intensive techniques. So the title of uh, what I want to talk about is, is the rise of big video data, um, which will culminate in the Square Kilometer Array project. Um, so first I'll start talking about the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, this is a picture of a piece of the Square Kilometer Array, a small piece of the Square Kilometer Array. And you see that what you're seeing here is, is a, a rather randomly distributed array of um, satellite antenna dishes. Uh, each one of these is 15 meters across. Um, but this project, in fact, spans a very, very large piece of, of, the, uh, of the Earth. Uh, the little blue square there shows you what we're seeing in that first picture. That's a, that's a part of a cluster which is right at the core of the square kilometer array of about several hundred of those antennas. Those antennas go out to distances of several thousand kilometers. And in, and in total, there are 3,000 fiber-connected radio antennas all working in concert and spitting out data at a big rate. So this picture of the telescope is a, it's the kind of picture that you like if you're a civil engineer or electronics engineer or a structural engineer um, because it's a big, big piece of metal and a, a big connected uh, distributed uh, facility. The other way to look at the project though is, is from its data flow. 
And um, there are within this project two big data challenges. So these, these boxes here are the, are the various antennas outlying up to 3,000 kilometers, all connected by a big fiber optic uh, pipe, uh, uh, multiple pipes feeding a big central processing facility. And this is the first big data challenge. And that big data challenge is, is not actually an exciting one. It's a large one. It's a very large one. It's an exabyte a second data coming into a device here, which has to process that data in real time. But it's processing it in a well-defined, predefined way. We know what we want to do with that data, we just got to crunch it really quickly. So that's, that's a very non-interesting uh, big data challenge. The really interesting big data challenge is what comes out of that, which is the science data, which somehow has to get out to the world community of scientists to do what we want to do, the research and answer our questions. And that's a data challenge which has many, many facets to it. Astronomy is at the core, that's the reason we're doing it, but it's, it's data science in a big way. It's engineering, it's sociology, it's governance, it's politics, it's business. All of those aspects need to be brought to bear to solve that particular challenge. And that's the one I'm going to talk about in the rest of my story. So here's a, a plot that shows the growth of data rates in radio astronomy um, over the last two decades. And here again is a place where I'll, I'll mention Canadian leadership because this, the, the baseline project here, the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey, was I think the first large data intensive global collaboration to put together a big piece of data to answer a big question. What we were doing there was we were mapping the Milky Way galaxy in the same way that we're working today on mapping the human body. Three-dimensional image of the galaxy that we live in so that we understand the workings of galaxies and how stars are formed and how planets are formed. So that involved 60 collaborators around the world, produced over 10 years of gigantic 70 gigabytes of data, which at the time was very scary, but at the end of the project it was not so scary. But this is the baseline, and you see that over, over the course of the next uh, 10 years or so, we are rising an exponential curve here. This is a, 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 a semi-log plot. So the data rates are increasing exponentially, in fact they're increasing at 150% per year. Uh, right now we're about here. Uh, these projects are also projects led by Canadians. So, Canada, in fact, um, is a world leader in data intensive radio astronomy, and we're driving the state of the art in many of the techniques that we need to evolve to solve these problems. Here at the SKA, around after 2020, we're at the volumes of a fraction of a petabyte a second coming out of that device, um, which uh, is almost un unimaginable, as sort of 70 gigabytes was unimaginable in 1990. So, this is the challenge that we're facing. Now, when designing a big facility like the Square Kilometer Array, we, 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 say, we, we think about what are the big science questions we want to ask, uh, and we design the facility to ask those, answer those questions. But it, it's, it's historically a fact that every time we build a new telescope, it interrogates the world in a different way, opens up uh, a region of parameter space for observing the universe that we've never observed before. The biggest breakthroughs are the ones that we did not anticipate. The world is stranger than you can imagine. And our imagination is really limited by the way that we look at the world and what we can see. And we, when we see new things, uh, things we haven't imagined pop out. So this data, this, this tidal wave of data rate that's, that's growing over the next 10 years contains within it the answers to both questions that we can imagine that are exciting to us, but also questions that we haven't actually asked yet. And so it's a really interesting data mining question problem to confront a big data set like this and ask yourself, well, how am I going to extract the questions that I actually know I want to answer, answers to, but how do I actually delve in there and figure out things that I didn't really know in the first place? So it's a broad spectrum of, of challenges. So the sociological aspect of this is that, that we're changing the way in which we actually do big science now in the world. Um, the, the, the SK project has defined uh, several key science observations it's going to do, and uh, those key science projects are now going to be done by distributed teams of astronomers around the world. And this is just one example uh, of the countries that are involved in uh, a few of the large projects being planned for the precursor telescopes being built in South Africa right now. And you see there's 22 countries involved, 121 institutes. There's a sociological problem of how you actually marshal that in a queer way to actually do the science and doing it around the problem of big data. Even within a country, 
at, at, a, at a lower level, um, there are, uh, here in Canada, we have 10 universities across the, across the country that are involved in planning and execution of these projects. So there's, there's a challenge. Not only do we have big data, but we have distributed teams of researchers who want to answer the questions from the data. So there's a sociological change in the way that radio astronomy is now being done. In fact, this is not just radio astronomy, but uh, um, other, other fields of astronomy, in fact, other, other areas of science. The old method was, was a single observer like me would, would think about a good idea, write a proposal to a facility, go to the facility, observe, walk, walk back or drive back to my home institute with a floppy disk under my arm, plug it into my computer, process the data, write a paper, and do it over and over again. Get lots of publications and promotion. That's no longer the way it's being done. The way it's being done now are big data sets being produced by global collaborations of researchers. And that's, uh, there's lots of complications. So here's the challenge. Very high data rates, very high volumes. So that's the technical challenges of storage, transfer, access, delivery of the raw data to the people that are going to actually extract the science. It's a complex, multi-purpose data set. Uh, these, these large volumes of data are meant to answer many different kinds of questions, and, then, and you, so you interrogate the data in different ways, you process it in different ways. Uh, it's much like the, uh, the Bitly application we saw, uh, turning the noisy weather data into actually a map of, of, uh, of weather. The data you get out of this does not have the information visible at first look. You have to do things to it to get it out. Well, it's complex and multi-purpose, and you have the added complication that is now being done by collaborative teams. They're globally distributed. Um, they're remote. Um, they have to work, house, work some way on processing the data, analyzing it, extracting the science. You have the issues of governance, provenance, usage. How do you manage all of those aspects of confronting the big data stream? So there's, there's a traditional approach to solving this problem, which is, I think, one that won't work. It's not scalable. is to put a massive investment in, in the place where the data is coming out and process it and spit out the resulting products to the user community. So the observatories take on the role processing that data and extracting the answers and sending it off to the scientists. So, obvious cause to this is that it's a monolithic system that's not scalable, puts all of the control and things into a central authority, which is not really the way that we do things anymore. And it's been the theme of this uh, uh, conference, in fact, uh, the collaborative and distributive nature uh, that's being enabled by networking and, uh, and new technologies. You get one pass through the data because whatever processing system you set up has to keep up with the exabyte a second coming in. So you don't really get uh, to do things twice. It disenfranchises the end users from the intellectual development of the, of the new algorithms, technologies. And it's an old way of looking at the world. It's not in tune with the global revolution of networking, lateral communication, open collaborative development, and, and the social capital, which is becoming an important commodity in our modern world. We're, we're, we're moving from a, from a situation where uh, financial capital um, is the dominant driver for the economy to a situation where social capital, harnessing vast groups of people to work on problems, is becoming a, an important part of our economy. So the alternative approach is to use new technologies and the new revolution in communication technology to empower the end user, build on that social capital, and, and, and confront this big data in a way that brings those new technologies to bear. So, uh, and, and in fact brings the global resources into the problem. And these, uh, the kind of things that you can then imagine doing is online access to HPC clouds and smart data clouds, collaborative development of algorithms, online visualization, ingestion and creation of data sets, and all the social networking and e-science um, tools that you can develop uh, within a globally distributed environment. Aha, I'm down here. Okay, so we have, um, we're working on exactly that kind of system here in Canada called the Cyber SKA project. Uh, it brings together universities across the, the country. Uh, we have um, many partners in this enterprise, uh, including universities, uh, organizations like Canary and Siberia, which have been very, very valuable in this collaboration, governments and industry. And I'll just very quickly go through some of the things that we've developed. Uh, we've done it within a collaborative portal, so we have a social networking environment that we brought to bear on this problem. This is something that the old dyed in the wool astronomers at first blush don't really see the value of, but all the young emerging scientists in the field love it because it's what they're used to and they, and they, 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 they write in. 
We have a smart distributed data system uh, built on uh, interoperability um, and, and a smart system that allows us to distribute the data in a way that allows uh, efficient access between the computer and the data and the user and the data. Uh, we have an online visualization tool, which is something that uses a technology developed here in Calgary by Calgary Scientific called PeerWeb, which enables, which web enables an application on a server. Um, and right, th this is an example of a half terabyte uh, hyperspectral data cube produced um, in one of our projects, being, a, being looked at in real time online through all dimensions of the cube. So you can run your cursor over this, this image, and these profiles for the cubes update in real time. And it's, it's half a terabyte of data, which is pretty amazing. And I've done this from my hotel room around the world. It can be done with just a normal connection to the internet. Um, I like this plot because it demonstrates the enabling of discovery from this kind of collaborative approach to, to astronomy. Uh, what, we're show, what I'm showing here is a team um, that has 70 uh, collaborators within the portal that is looking for new pulsars. So these, are, these are transient signals from uh, very, very dense collapsed stellar objects, things that the mass of the sun with the size of Calgary rotating very quickly, producing pulses. And by employing the cyber SK technologies, they've actually quadrupled their discovery rate of new pulsars in the sky. So they do, this approach does enable technologies. Uh, it's a growing um, platform. We have 252 members as of a few days ago from all over the world. Um, and what I'd like to end on is that here again is another example of leadership coming out of Canada. We're building a cyber platform which could be the platform that enables the data from the SKA to be, to be ingested into the world and managed by the world. So we can imagine a, a global network of centers around the world, one of them being in Canada, uh, that, that are the engine of the data from the SKA. They're actually part of the instrument. These centers keep the global data engine running. Uh, they're the places where the big data science happens, big data engineering, network computing, astronomy, the business opportunities are developed. Um, we, we can build that upon this kind of cyber infrastructure. That then feeds to a, a larger community of researchers around the world who can connect up through normal connectivity. Uh, and you can in fact crowdsource and bring in, in, in citizen science. And by doing so, turn the globe into the data solution for this global telescope. That's that's the big data story coming out of this work on here, right? Great stuff. Thank you. So uh, we'll keep questions in the back of your mind because we'll certainly have some time afterwards. But um, next up, I'd like to uh, bring up Robert Windsor, who doesn't need much of an introduction, but of course is the president and CEO of Cybera. So, um, Robert, as you get ready, I did hear earlier that he was so inspired by. Pachachkacha last night, and he's decided to do something similar with his presentation today, which is very daring. And very, I like it. Um, and uh, first and foremost, just thank you for hosting this conversation the last couple of days. It's an important annual conversation, and uh, to you and the whole team for bringing this together, thank you very much. Thanks, Jasmine, for yeah. being a part of the team, and it's been, all, it's been a lot of fun. I accept my honorary Siberian status. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. And on to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and do this Pachanchi style. Um, and is that now running? So I, I'm, I'm into my time already. Okay. So what I want to talk about is um, not so much the bits and bytes, but the philosophy behind what we're doing. The responsibility that we have. I'd like to start out by looking at different ways of change. So this is the Battle of Creasy. 1346, we've got a few thousand English troops against a much greater French force, uh, 10, 20,000 uh, French. And the English won. Why did they win? Because they had longbows, and it was raining. The French had crossbows, and crossbow, you can only pull it back so far. So they couldn't adapt. There was a change that you have to get with, or it's going to sweep you past. A hundred years later, you've got students in universities throughout Europe studying in much the way that they would normally do, their books, they're listening to a professor. But what about the books? Where are they getting the books from? Well, they're getting the books. They're being produced by does work if you point at the slides in the it's good. Um, they're being produced by monks in scriptoriums. These monks would produce these marvelous books. They'd work on them um, slowly, day by day, illustrating them, copying them. Um, they were absolutely beautiful. It would take an entire lifetime sometimes to produce a Bible. Maybe uh, they might manage to get to work on two in a lifetime. But that was a piece of work that 
was just accepted as that's how you produce it. And of course, the, uh, the, the books that they produce today are works of art, they're collector's pieces, that's great, but really we don't want to pay that much for a book. But everything changes a hundred years after the Battle of Crecy when Gutenberg invents the printing press. And today, this seems very, very obvious. Um, clearly, that's how you would produce books. You wouldn't sit there and produce them longhand over a lifetime. And books are so much a part of what we do. Of course, that's changing as well. But with Gutenberg's invention of the printing press, let me see the printing press here, um, everything changes in terms of production rates. This is the start of an amazing explosion of data and availability. And I like to look at these old pictures of the, uh, the printing press and look at the fact that there's a case off to the side of the press itself holding the letters for the movable type. And in the upper case, they have the capital letters, and in the lower case, they have the lower ones. That's why we call them upper and lower case today. But this is the first big data explosion. You've got a few million books um, at the start of the Elizabethan age, and hundreds of millions of books at the end of the Elizabethan age. And they had just as much of a problem figuring out how, how to handle this big data explosion as we do today. Now, fortunately, in those days, everything was run by the church, and so it was pretty easy. You catalogued stuff as the sacred and the profane. <coughs> and what could be harder than that? <coughs> that works for a little while. It's not essentially what we would call today scalable, but at least it did kind of work for them. Um, once they started to run into problems, they bring in the big thinkers of the day, and you say, okay, well, what are we going to do with this cataloging problem? Francis Bacon comes along and says, well, you know, sacred and profane is not going to work. Let's, uh, let's have a, a more detailed cataloging system. And he adds POSI to the, uh, to the uh, set of catalogs. Um, what the heck's POSI? Um, basically, poetry was a major form of, um, of printed work at that time was, uh, was that. But nobody was too worried about this. Yes, you know, you get into big questions about how the cataloging goes. It keeps on going along. Um, Dewey versus Cutter in terms of whether or not we have the Dewey Decimal System or the Cutter System. Um, Dewey said, let's just figure out catalogs for everything, um, and we'll subdivide from there. Cutter says, let's just catalog what's in the library. Of course, we all know that Dewey eventually wins. But nobody's really getting displaced. It's not in their face. It's not a big problem for an established industry. Now, maybe that's changing as well, as we all buy Kindles and iPads, and the bookstore starts to disappear, which will make me very sad, by the way. There's nothing I look better than to sit in a nice, comfy chair, some cookies, a drink, and a book. Um, you know, this, is, this is definitely my comfort zone. But um, we recognize that it's a change that we can adapt to gradually. But let's fast forward a few hundred years more to find out the third model of reacting to change. Um, Jacquard invents the, uh, the, the programmable loom. And this is programmed with punch cards, which inspired Babbage to build the difference engine, which then inspired uh, Alan, um, Alan Turing to start coming up with the Turing test and inventing artificial intelligence. The picture of um, Jacquard there was actually woven on one of those looms. But what you find is that this displaces workers, industrial workers, and they don't like it one little bit. So you have um, the Luddite revolution. Uh, this strange looking person is Ned Ludd. Um, and the British had more troops fighting the Luddites, who were trying to smash the machines of industrial production, than they did ought to have troops fighting Napoleon on the continent. So um, big, big pushback. Today, what's happening? Well, um, we have Russ building his square telescope, a uh, square kilometer array telescope, and massive amounts of data coming. Well, that doesn't seem very frightening. I mean, it's a bit challenging, but it's not terribly frightening. But really, to get through that data set, we have to develop artificial intelligence. Because without artificial <laughs> intelligence, we're not going to get in there. Now, some of you are chuckling because you saw Watson, the IBM supercomputer, playing Jeopardy on, uh, on TV. And it was really, really cool. Um, I, I studied AI back in Edinburgh in the 70s, and I, I would have assumed that we would have this by the 80s, and clearly I was very, very wrong on that one. But in terms of passing the Turing test, Alan Turing said that if you can't tell the difference between the responses of a person and a machine, you must either conclude that the machine is intelligent or that the person is not. And I'm sure we know some people who might fail the Turing test. But that aside, um, clearly we're getting to the point where the Turing test is indeed being passed by machines. And that's a little scary, but, you know, as long as it's some computer somewhere in a lab, well, we're not going to be too scared about that either. We can accept that. But here's an interesting little critter. This is called a sea squirt. Now, what's that got to do with anything? A sea squirt lives most of its life swimming around the ocean as a little larval thing. But one time in its life, it starts to mature. It finds a rock. It anchors on its rock. 
And it's going to be there for the rest of its life as this rather pretty looking spongy thing. The first thing it does for nutrition, it eats its brain. Why does it do that? Because you don't need a brain if you don't move around. Only things that move around and sense their environment have brains in the natural world. So when we have robots that are standing on a production line, again, they're not too scary. But once they start moving around, whether it's our little robot vacuum cleaner, or the military robots, or the drones, they become a little scary. And so those of us who perhaps don't want jobs looking like we are already human robots, who want to have better, more enriching lives, we're going to have to say, do we want the machines to put us here? Do we? I think we probably don't. What we probably want is to have fulfilling jobs doing interesting, high-tech things. Doing some of the things that you hear about at conferences like this. So, I'm about to hit my last slide in my Pachachka, but I have the advantage over the Pachachka people last night of still having a couple of minutes on the clock over here. So, um, if that's not too much cheating, I want to just sort of make you think about this. How are we going to react to this brave new world of big data, of artificial intelligence, of robotics that we see coming along? What are we going to think when the sequencing that Andrew talked about uh, yesterday at his keynote allows us to produce amazing new life forms, to knock out personal medicine? How are we going to think when the computers know so much about us, as we've seen from the um, analysis that um, Hillary was talking about through the Bitly piece, something as simple as a URL shortener. Are we going to say, this is a change that's absolutely in our face and we have to deal with it right now? Well, no, it's not like the Battle of Creasy. Is it something like, um, <clears throat> is it something like um, the invention of the printing press? Well, I'd say it's kind of like that, but once the robots start moving around, is it going to feel like this threatening industrial machines? I would say that, along the theme of leadership in the age of big data, it's up to all of us who are in privileged positions to attend conferences like this and other ones like it, where we get together with thought leaders in the space to help everybody else that we deal with who are not in this space understand the changes that are coming, think about what they mean, really think through the implications. Because one thing's for sure, even if we decide that this is scary stuff, we're not going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. That telescope's going to be built, the data's going to be available, Hillary's going to know what we're doing, Andrew's going to produce weird and wonderful life forms, other people are going to produce the robots, it's going to happen. But if we thought it ahead, then we don't have to be scared by it. We can embrace it, we can say we understand, we see the pitfalls are there, we can avoid that one, we see the advantages are here, and maybe we're going to run into trouble every now and again. But this is a technology that promises so much. If we use it right, we're going to do well. We mustn't let our fellow citizens be scared of it, be frightened by what they see and don't understand. It's up to all of us to be advocates for this technology as well as engineers of it. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, next up is Michael Corin, who is the uh, co-founder and managing director of Major Planet Studios. And, um, you know, we definitely listed Michael as a, as a storyteller, but I think everyone here really is. And uh, Michael is also a contributor to, um, you may have heard of these magazines, such as The Economist and Fast Company, uh, and focuses on science, the economics, and, and the environment. So here to tell us about his world and epic data is Michael. Welcome. Thanks. So, uh, I agree, I mean, I've interviewed hundreds of scientists and I think these are two of the better storytellers in that field that I've heard, so I will, will do my best to uh, follow up. So, I, I'm here to talk a little bit about the idea that story is actually one of the most powerful forces um, that we have to shape reality. And I'm speaking as a science journalist, but also as a media entrepreneur. Um, I think stories are the human reality, but atoms essentially are the physical one. I'm not arguing that we can get, get, out, you know, get escape reality uh, through stories, although people do try to do that, but that um, essentially what we will see certain truths and accept or reject them based on the stories that we tell. So I've called this epic data. Epic um, meaning essentially these uh, poems or these stories that we tell, usually about a hero, some legendary, legendary adventures, or the history of a nation that speak to some essential truths. And uh, I think there are two classic ones that you may have seen. Um, this one was shown earlier in the uh, 
conference by Jen Lowe. Basically, it's the French attempt, attempted French invasion of Russia. And what it really is, is um, one of the lowest points, I think, of humanity, um, one of our, our worst things of, of war, and um, 422,000 French troops leaving Paris and only 10,000 returning. Um, that, that basically very small, narrow thread, the black line coming back. Um, and it tells in one picture all you need to know, temperature, mortality, geography, um, but also a very stark picture uh, of some of the worst that humanity can do. But then there's also the best. And I think you know, we can say that uh, humans have increased their late standard of living in the last hundred years in ways that we never imagined, but um, not in quite the same way that this story tells it. And if you've ever seen Han Rosling's uh, data visualizations, I, I highly recommend you watch this. But I will just show you where we start off with Canada in 1900 and all of the countries in the world. And as we uh, invent penicillin, and then uh, we work through uh, mass hygienic campaigns, we start uh, mass producing antibiotics in, in 45, and then mass vaccinations. Essentially, there is no one on the planet, there is no average citizen in the world that is, has a lower life expectancy than the Canadian in 1900. Um, that's remarkable, and that's also going to be very, I think, indicative of what's going to happen in the next century only. It's going to happen much faster. So, um, I just want to tell you personally why I think that story is one of the most important forces in the world, both as a science journalist and then as an entrepreneur. So as a journalist, I think what that means is I go out in the world and I tell stories and I have to make sure that they're true. Um, essentially, I'm, I'm out searching through tons of material, looking for facts, thoughts, ideas, and scouring for those few grams that will actually make it into a story. And I know that, incidentally, I found many of those here this week, and I, I know that the power these stories can have. A few symbols on the page or on a screen can essentially elevate or decimate an idea, an individual, or a company. Uh, I see it every day, and those pixels and those dots change reality. On the other hand, um, I'm also an entrepreneur. So uh, I am uh, co-founded Major Planet Studios. Essentially what we're, we're doing is creating a multimedia publishing platform uh, for storytelling. Um, you can think of it as uh, Adobe for beautiful multimedia stories, but you don't have to be a designer to use it. Um, the idea here is, as an entrepreneur, I discovered that I think my job is to tell stories, compelling stories, that I have to make sure come true. So to my team, uh, you know, we're all investing our time and our effort in the idea of what Major Planet can do um, and uh, of the effect we can have on the world. And for our customers, uh, we're doing the same. They have to believe in the vision for them to buy uh, the publishing, publishing uh, tool that we're creating. And for our investors, um, the pitch is no less a story. Uh, they're investing their, their money uh, and their faith in us and uh, that story also needs to be told. So I think, what do I mean by a story? And as any writer can tell you, we only have a handful. All of humanity only tells six to 10 plots throughout history. And um, from Beowulf to the Bhagavad Gita to Shakespeare to West Side Story, and more or less six stories. And changes, of course, the themes or at least the, the characters. But um, it's actually not so different. And so this, to me, has been you know, an epic. Every time I look at this image, it, it, to me, it's as, as engrossing as a novel. And that's uh, the cave paintings at Lascaux. And uh, Homer and Iliad and Odysseus, uh, no different there. Basically, this was the Bible for the Greeks. Their epic poems taught them how to live. It was their worldview. No less than religion or science is for us moderns. And so that, I think, in itself, demonstrates the power of story. And when I was in Morocco, this is Jamal Fana, this is a, a square in Marrakesh, uh, one of the oldest cities in the region. And what this person is doing is following a thousands of years old tradition of oral storytelling. They basically memorize a thousand one Arabian nights, whole epic stories, and then recount them for weeks at a time, one story in this square. They're UNESCO living heritage, and there's only six of them left. Um, they're very elderly, there's no apprentices for them. But Again, this is essentially what we are. Um, and I think what the, the reason for that, and of course we always have to find new ways to tell our stories, and so we adapt uh, old forms for, for new times. Um, but what do these stories do? Why are they so powerful? 
and I think um, they do three things. Stories are us. They basically um, allow us to, com to, to compose our reality. And they're a tool to make sense of the world. Uh, we use them to sort through all that we're seeing, all that we're experiencing, and to make it, make it into something that we understand. And then finally, it's one of the more powerful forces to shape the reality that we perceive. And so, the first thing, I think, is, is this idea of they are us. Stories are our reality. There are no, in my research, any anthropologist has found a society that doesn't tell stories, that doesn't actually use stories as the basis for their identity, both as a society and, and also as individuals. And um, I think there was uh, lots of quotes to choose from, but this one was particularly uh, apt of this idea that to be human is to tell stories. And the second thing is to organize our world. Uh, essentially, stor stories are, are a very powerful way of sharing individual experiences and, sh and creating co-realities so that we can actually work together. Um, so it's an evolutionary engine, essentially, to understand our world. And in science, it's called theories. In business, I think it's called a culture. And in politics and social science, it's the master narrative. Essentially, these shared realities we all have that are so hard to break out of, but at the same time are so powerful in getting us all to work together to understand the world in a com common way. Um, and then this quote I thought was particularly apt for that. Defining the world, um, making sense of it without defining it. And finally, this idea of, 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 of the future of the world depends, um, it belongs to those who can actually tell the most compelling stories that explain essential truths. And I think um, this idea, you know, we always turn back to Shakespeare, but um, this idea is, is true in literature, it's also true in war. We don't aim to obliterate the enemy, we actually aim for hearts and minds. If you talk to modern warfare strategists, that is always the objective, uh, at least in, in modern times. Um, but just as important is the ability to retell stories for our times and make sense of them. And uh, Salman Rushdie, as she's a great example of how that can happen. Um, when Salman Rushdie wrote the Satanic Verses, he, uh, a, a fatwa, a death edict, edict was issued. He reinterpreted <coughs> he reinterpreted Islam from those who, not, who did not think that story belonged to him. But Salman Rushdie thinks that the narrative of society belongs to everyone in it, and that its power belongs to those who tell the story. And so he has an excellent quote, that those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, to rethink it, to deconstruct it and joke about it, and change it as times change, truly are powerless because they cannot think new thoughts. Max Planck also said, I think in science, that science progresses one funeral at a time. And um, there's unfortunately some truth to that. And that's not just science. I want to pick on science. I think it's true for a lot of things. Um, so let that be a warning too. Um, so data. So where am I going back with this? So we're telling stories. That's great. Yes, yada, yada. But what does it mean about data? And how can we use that? And, and how can we lead in this era? So I think this is the beginning of data and stories. This is the Bill of Mortality. In 1455, the printing press was invented a century later. We began to pass, uh, we have law, uh, death certificates. And then almost a century after that, we started actually recording these. The king wanted to know who was dying, who was living, why were they dying. And this is from Jay Walker, if you want to go online and watch his talk. Um, but basically the idea was um, we were to have the first, world's first health reports here. This is the first data story. And it's a very compelling story. Um, you can see there are lots of deaths from worms, from wind, um, a very ill-fated overlaid uh, person. Teeth was a big killer. Um, but what you don't see here is plague. Actually, you see zero. But that changes. That changes very quickly. It goes from zero to 700, several months later to 7,000, peaks at 7,165, and then goes down. And what was interesting about that is that it occurs that there's, not a, pa there's a pattern in the data. And as Jay Walker says, it's a pattern in the data, more than patterns on the hand, on the head, in the sky. And from this, we get probability, statistics, insurance, and honestly, big data. So, where are we now? So, orrery, sorry, this is an orrery. This essentially is the big data of its time. It is all the known information about the solar system in the early 1700s. The Greeks had them, but this was the first modern one. It's driven by a clockwork mechanism, essentially with a sun in the middle and planets on the outside. And in it, in its, in its clockwork gears, essentially, is all the data that we knew about the way the world works. But there's an epic here that's not displayed. So this epic, I think, is its pursuit of knowledge. It's man's place in the cosmos. 
and it's the drama of a world that's just about to dawn. But, you know, you look at this and you think, great, it's a planetarium of some sort. But the drama is in this picture. This is the same exact object, but it's done, painted by, um, this is Joseph Wright, who's an English painter, who for the first time put at the center of this classic painting style, something that wasn't religion, it wasn't aristocracy, it wasn't a fruit bowl, it was actually science. And it represents a new world. This is the awe that everyone is experiencing, is what we feel today, and was totally new at the time. And if you look at their faces, they're all the half faces of the moon. So you have full, gibbous, half, and lower. So there's so much going on in this, and it's a science story. It's a human story, but it's a science story. So we go from this to this. Now, where are we today? So, at the time, we could fit all the data we knew about the world into this little device. This is where we are now. Now, Deep Field Hubble is um, something you might be familiar with. That's nice. This is the next step. This is going to be the Space Telescope 2018, the Max Webb. Um, I might not compare the radio telescope, but <laughs> it's going to be an infrared uh, telescope. Too big to launch um, uh, open. It's going to be larger than a tele uh, tennis court. It's fully inflated, uh, fully um, expanded. Canada is also involved in this. Um, but essentially, we'll look from the very first light after the Big Bang to the formation of planets. And that is the scale that we're moving from. So, what does it mean for you, or as my editor says, why does the audience care? And I think there are three reasons, um, and I'll just go through them very quickly. The first one is that there's a virtual world that's forming that mirrors the fidelity of the real one. For the first time, I've been working on a story about big data, and also I worked on a book called The Human Face of Big Data, and it became very clear that the world that's forming on the databases, the networks, the hardware, um, the information we're collecting from the Internet of Things, the sensors, creates a world that's accessible, that mirrors the real one in ways we never imagined. Every two years, we're, we're creating one, every year we're creating 1.8 zettabytes of information. That's doubling every year. The whole internet in 2009 is half a, a zettabyte. So, what does that mean? Um, we are going to basically live in an empirical world where we can actually query the data for things that we never could before. We've always lived in an uncertain world, but we've also lived in a world where the data didn't exist for us to ask questions. That, I don't think, will any longer be true. We think we collect a lot of information from social networks. We actually give more information to retailers than social networks. And we actually get more information from cell phones if we wanted to. Cell phones everyone's carrying and we get from all of those things. In fact, scientists using accelerometers in your cell phone can diagnose depression. By using accelerometer data, they can actually see that you move faster or slower at any given time. The distribution of movement along that curve can actually show mental illness, depression, other, other illnesses. We haven't even scratched the surface of that, but that's the world we're going into. And then finally, this idea of plane, that we don't, we're not gonna live in a world where we have single data points or spreadsheets or graphs. Those will become like the abacus. I think we're gonna live in a world where we interact with data in ways that we never imagined. And we're not even close to interacting with machines in the way that we need to. And this is what I mean by, by improvision of playing. Anyone know what this is? <laughs> I'm Miles Davis. Miles Davis is kind of blue. And what that is, is someone, that's something that was never written down. That was an improvised album, one of the best albums of all time. And it was shared musicality, and it was ability for humans who shared something in common to come up with something truly remarkable. And when machines and people can work in that way, then we're actually going to see that this emerge, which is the data sense. That's my working title, basically. But the idea there being that humans and machines work in ways that we never imagined, and we haven't even scratched the surface. The user interface, if you want to use a technical term today, is um, crude, to say the least. So um, really quickly, I'm just going to wrap this up. Basically, this is the first version, I think, V01, of what the data sense is gonna look like. Quid is a startup in San Francisco, part of my research for the story, and this is all of the big data stories in the last three months, 86,000 stories downloaded in 10 minutes and put into a data set. I'm gonna show you what you can do with it. Essentially, I'm going there, looking at the different clusters of stories. Each one of these right here 
is a different cluster representing an idea space. These idea spaces, you can click on highlight, see in the right hand corner, these are all the articles that are in that idea space. And then on the right hand side are the, um, the map of where they, where they are. You can see the Obama, Mitt Romney, and marketing. That, for some reason, is a, big, is a large big data conversation. Um, Dell, fluid data, that's one. Microsoft, another one in social analytics, social media. Um, and then you can actually click on any individual article, see how they're connected to others, and then um, click on the actual story itself and read that. So I can get an idea, essentially, become an expert in a space in a matter of hours, what might take someone months or actually been impossible. In fact, I can download the amount of reading an expert can do in a lifetime, 10 million documents in one day. The nature of an expertise will change. It will not be about how much do you know, it is how you use what you know to interpret the data. And this is just another way to see that same information. So I'm cross-referencing degree and betweenness. So two different ways, to, this is just really scratching the surface. I can actually say, well, Information that's in between different ideas is actually very interesting when you look at it over the long term. It's the most, tends to be the most innovative, most profitable ideas or companies. And you can measure that against social media sharing. So I can see what people are talking about and where it falls in the basically connectivity and then the betweenness factor. So, what is, um, we talked about that backwards for some reason. Um, and so, to, to wrap things up, um, I think, you know, this is the world we're going to live in. This is the, the beginning of the world we live in today. But the world we're going to live in tomorrow is something we can hardly imagine. The thing that I think we share with the earlier times is that it has to come in the form of a story. And uh, that story is for all of you and all of us to write. So, thanks a lot. As I, and I kind of put that as like a blob that is, you know, the media as an entity, but has been in many ways traditional media as opposed to social, um, slow to adopt new technology, but at the same time we're here talking about what it means to be a leader in technology. So I'm curious about commentary on, especially with what you're doing with Major Planet, what we're seeing here with Quid. Um, what role does the media have in, uh, in adopting technology and telling the story about technology and kind of being a leader in uh, kind of consumer and mass adoption? And, so, I, I read a quote recently that I think kind of describes it. So, every time the internet encounters an industry, it eviscerates it and then makes it look a lot like the internet. And um, it's happened in music and everything else, and it's happening in the media, it's just been slower. I won't go into the economics of why major media has lasted as long as it has, but essentially what's happening is disaggregation of the entire media supply chain. And to think that the New York Times is going to figure out distribution of global news is just not going to happen. They're really good at reporting. And they're actually really good at maybe publishing in some ways, but not everything else. And so I think there, we need to get over this idea that New York Times is going to exist in the form it does. Um, New York Times needs to focus on what it does well. And then uh, groups like Prismatic, I think, are a big data company that wants to be the world's newspaper. The idea of having the world's newspaper didn't used to make sense, but it makes perfect sense now. There are no economies of scale to publish on the web. There are, we don't need printing presses. I work in the former San Francisco Chronicle building, mm -hmm. former. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where we're going to go. And so it's really I f it ridiculous that when I walk into a newsroom in San Francisco, I'm looking at technology developed in sometimes 1990s, usually mid-2000s at the best. And what we're doing at Major Planet is so basic in some ways that it's shocking. Um, it's just the idea of maybe we can tell stories that don't look like a print newspaper. Maybe we can actually take multimedia out of the sort of ghetto on the sidebar and put it into a story. I did a little bit of that here, but again, scratching the surface. So, mm -hmm. was it data that drove what you guys were doing at Major Planet, or was it things like HTML5? So, H, so the, again, I think technology is an enabling factor. It's not the end. Yeah. And um, HTML5 is great, uh, and it'll get a lot better. But um, the the real secret sauce is design. Mm -hmm. Is design. Um, it's user interface, user experience, it's testing, it's essentially a scientific method, something called lean, in entrepreneurial circles now, lean, lean methodology is very big. Essentially it's, instead of thinking I know what to do and just doing it and spending a lot of money on it, I test things first and then I execute. So, I, we are very data driven in a way, um, but we don't have the resources to be big data right now.
but the point being, I guess, is it's all about design and experience driven back by empirical data. Mm -hmm. That's an overarching theme we've heard throughout the past couple of days is, uh, is aesthetics and, and UI and uh, making things beautiful allows for more adoption. Yeah. And Robin, you have some comments on well, that? Yeah, I was just thinking that, that one of the things that we heard at last year's summit, for those of you who were here, um, Tim Wu was here talking about the history of the internet and the history of telephony and telegraphy and television and media, cinema, and how in all those areas, uh, monopolies came up. Initially, there was the idea that suddenly there was the ability to publish everywhere uh, or spread your word, and it was going to be a new democratizing theme. And then, just by the way that things work, they end up in monopolies with controlling them. And you just mentioned a, you know, a New World newspaper. Um, it seems to me that, that there might be some natural monopolies out there. And if they're allowed to form, um, don't we lose a lot of the color of the world? If there's one world newspaper, if there's one design standard, doesn't it get to be a boring world? So that's really interesting. I think it's a semantic difference. And here's what, here's what I mean by that. So when I say one world newspaper, I guess when I look at Amazon, does that mean I have one store? Kinda, but it also means I have access to any product that wants to be in that store. Amazon actually does it for a lot of different groups. What, 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 what Prismatic does says, we will, be your, we will be a customized newspaper for whatever you want to do. And there'll always be two or three. And network effects tend to, you know, one, two, three maybe. I think there is a risk. I think there's a huge risk involved with that. But I'm actually not worried that the particular technology that comes out on top is going to be so monolithic that it won't be like everyone reads the New York Times. It'll be like everyone reads the Guardian, everyone reads the New York Times, everyone reads whatever they want, but it's funneled through a few large networks. Let's talk about that a little bit because one really interesting thing about the ability to mine data is uh, the ability to then um, present the end user with specific uh, customized data. Um, are we allowing for too much customization, therefore, instead of becoming leaders in adoption, are we creating more narrow-minded delivery of information? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to speak. I was struck by uh, your quote about, if you're not able to question and make fun of your story, mm. you, you, you can't change the way you think. And um, well, as, as a scientist, the really exciting aspect of what I do is pushing the boundaries of the science story that will work for you. You may have about the way things work, the way things are. And my comment at the beginning of my talk about the fact that we were limited and we're boxed in by our imagination. Historically, the way that we've gotten out of that box is by data. Right? Um, uh, in radio astronomy, there's been five Nobel Prizes over the last 34 years or so. And they have been driven by people that have been pushing at the edges of the data. Right? Um, and so what, what's exciting to me about this new big data uh, um, era is the fact that we're going to be pushed to think about things in ways that we have not to push at the boundaries of the story and to, and to make the story richer. It's, it's, a, it's a really exciting place to be. Yeah, I think that's right. So, so this idea that the filter bubble, I, it's, I'm not sure there's a lot of empirical evidence for that. I mean, yes, yes, there is some allowed. We have an affinity for story things that we agree with. But when you look at the actual evidence, when I do a search for stories, and I don't mean Google, I think a little beyond Google, I look at those data networks that I showed you, I'm seeing stuff that I never imagined. Because those aren't people who agree with me putting that in there. That's the data saying, look at this. There's a semantic relationship. And I, I just don't buy the filter. But I mean, OK, Fox News, maybe a lot of people watch it, CNN, whatever. Everyone has their, their thing. But, but when we start talking about empirical data about the real world and even like things that we create that are mediated by it, I'm not as worried. Fantastic. I've got a few more questions, but I'm wondering, there certainly has to be some from the audience. So Peter has a microphone. Oh, sorry, David. Yes. Any thoughts? Even just as far as um, other takeaways as well. You know, we're at the the end of the past couple of days. If anyone would like to share some takeaways on what they think it means to be a leader in this space or a learning that they've had, uh, the the floor is open. Is everyone looking forward to having a beer and calling it a day? <laughs> Absolutely. So as we wrap up, um, just maybe either either one of two, pick your choice. Um, one, just one statement about what you think it means to be a leader uh, in this space, or the other one is, what is a resource that you recommend to the audience um, when thinking about big data, uh, anything from virtualization to mining to, to moving it forward in the future? Um, one resource to look at, or just thoughts on what it means to be a leader? None of us want to go first, because we have to take a bit longer. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, 
One resource would be um, history. Uh, as we look forward, um, look back as well. It, it can tell us a lot about human nature because the technology changes, the data changes, but people essentially are people. And if we leave them out of the equation, we're going to get it wrong. Um, and actually, I think that pr pretty much tells me what I should do going forward as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll just pick that one. Yeah, I think we probably have a room full of leaders uh, in this, so it's like preaching to the, uh, the crowd. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're moving into a brave new world, and we saw that in many dimensions over the course of this meeting. And I think the, the, the lesson to take away is not to be afraid to step into that brave new world and to work the bold one. Um, I would just say that I think when I mean, you think about leadership more broadly, it's about making sure the people that you work with succeed. You should be, the leader should be invisible to the extent possible. But in relation to data, one of the most effective ways to make that possible is that we have no excuse now to have arbitrary decisions to make, to, to, to basically let the, how blinkered we all are for our own biases get in the way of making the right decision. And I try, at least in what we're doing, is build in metrics, build in feedback loop, be as open and transparent as possible in all the decisions we make and in how we operate together. And so I would say that as anyone starts a new project or starts a new team, to spend time, just a little time even, in the beginning and say, this is what we're trying to achieve. Here's the, the thousand free ways that we can measure this because everything on the internet is practically free. And um, you, know, you guys know as well as I do how to do this. Um, we're all going to figure it out together. And so uh, that's the working thesis I have. And uh, I think it, we'll see how it works out. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate your thoughts today. In closing, if anyone does want to take a hike and clear your head <laughs> after the past couple of days, uh, it's not a formal organized hike, but they, um, but there is a kind of a loose meeting, I think at about 3.30, uh, I believe, and there's a stack of um, local hiking mat trails um, just on the, on the registration table, so feel free to grab one um, and maybe possibly meet by the big lab if possible. We're going to end off uh, with the bingo, but before that, actually, maybe before we do the, the bingo, Robin, some closing thoughts from you. Sure. Um, I'd just like to uh, um, say thank you to a number of folks who have helped organize this event. Um, way ahead of the event, I mean, way, way ahead of the event, we had some folks uh, join our advisory panel and uh, they gave us some great input into how to structure this. Uh, I'd like to specifically thank uh, Pierre Lemire from uh, Calgary Scientific, uh, James Van Loon from Ventus, uh, Catherine Antonissen from uh, Canary, uh, Nathan Armstrong, formerly of Motive Industries and now in NUA, if I get it right, uh, Nathan. Uh, Chris, per Chris Perry, our, our uh, uh, breakout head from last year, the potato farmer from Chin, uh, with his brother Circle Group. Um, Jill Kowalchuk, now with um, Compute Canada, and Rainer Arashko, uh, who was with TR Labs at the time. So those, uh, those guys were great, really appreciated it. The Cybera team, of course, I've got to mention um, Megan Hempel, who's uh, done an amazing